hope to be conscious to the needs around us and to be aware of them, to encourage them to one another. You never know what other people are going through in their lives, so we can always talk with them and and walk with them. And uh, we just pray that we'd be known as uh, encouragers and loving one another. I lift, lift up the ministries of the church, Father, that everything that we do would be done in your name and to glorify you and that your kingdom would be brought by uh, the actors. I pr- lift up uh, the preacher for today, Brother Eastman, and I just pray that you would give him the word you would have us to hear. We just lift up uh, just this service, Father, and, and all those who are here, that you would open our minds and hearts and that our mind would be uh, geared toward glorifying you and everything that's done and said in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Matt and Jimmy and Mary. We're going to worship this morning.
Hello, I'm Chris Shaw. I wear the Pod Piper past the JV. Off to kids' worship. Um, parents, you're invited to go with them if you would like to. Um, they always encourage parents to join them back there and uh, have a good time. While they're leaving, just turn around and greet one another and say, man, I'm glad I don't serve on her team of media. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> we are going to go ahead and um, continue on with worship this morning with a hymn that we've sang here before. It may not be as familiar to some of you, um, but it, the words to it are fabulous. So um, we're going to go ahead on.
Okay. Okay. Okay, fine. Let's so like you've left us in feeling red. Like we could never bring you praise again, I feel like. Lord, I look forward to that day where we just get to sing and you sing your praises. That's all we do. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for a gathering of believers. We thank you that we can come hear your word. Lord, help us now to settle our hearts and our minds on what you would have us hear today and how you would have us carry it out throughout this week. Begin planting that in us at this moment, Lord. Thank you for all you've given us, and in your holy name we pray. Amen. If you came this morning expecting Rob to be here and forgot that he was going to be out of town, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, but Rob will be back next week, and he'll be continuing our study of Titus as we look at the characteristics of a great church. You know, for several weeks now, he's been looking at that book of Titus and, and looking at the qualities of what makes a church great. One of the things that makes a church great is people like you and, and me being together sharing under the leadership of God's servant that he's placed here in Rob, and to be as faithful and obedient as we possibly can to give our support, to uplift our pastor in prayer, and to always do in using our talents and our abilities to the very best of our abilities. For 48 years, I had the privilege of serving as pastor of a church. There wasn't a Sunday that I came and stood behind this sacred desk that I didn't come with a little bit of fear uh, and, and, and shaking nervously of what, in, what, the, what is God had placed upon my heart to share, that I might make a mistake, that I might say the wrong word, that I might stutter or something. And I knew that always there was someone else that could do a better job than I possibly could. But I wanted to do as very best that I possibly could. So in prayer, I asked God to place upon my heart the words that will be acceptable to him and to his people. And with that in mind, I come that way today, praying that God will use these moments that we have together to allow something that will be said that will bring us just a little bit closer to him and to be able to give all the glory and all the praise to him. Paul said, you know, when he was called to be a servant of the Lord, he was called not to be preaching what man had taught him or what he himself had placed upon his heart, but he came preach and share the revelation that God had placed upon his heart, that he would be the servant that would present not himself, but Jesus Christ. And every one of us who stand here as a minister, as an ambassador of God, want to do just that. We don't want people to be looking at us. They want us to be able to see, hopefully through the words that we share, the glory of Christ that we serve and that we proclaim. And so, as I built knelt in prayer before I came here, I just want to ask you to join with me in a moment of prayer right now and asking God to use these moments that we have together. Father, I thank you for the privilege that we have to be here this morning. I thank you that Rob entrusted me the opportunity to share the words that you've placed upon my heart. I thank you, Father, for the opportunity that I have to be one of your ambassadors, to be one of your servants and to proclaim and share the story that would bring glory not to us, but to you. We pray, Father, that all that is done and said here this morning will be for you and for you alone, that we will present your message, and that you will be glorified and lifted up, and in all things we would look to you, not to man, but look to you for direction and guidance in what you would have us to do. For we pray this in the glorious name of our risen Savior and the power of Christ our Lord. Amen. If you would open your Bibles to the 25th chapter of Matthew, and there we'll be looking at the story that Jesus told, some of the parables that he shared as he was speaking to his disciples. A little bit of thing and before we get into the 25th chapter, we look back into the 23rd chapter of Matthew, and we see that Jesus had the opportunity of going to the temple 
and there the people had gathered that morning to hear the pastor or to hear the rabbi bring the message. And he brought a message that was challenging to the church that day. He said, church, there are seven woes that I want you to be aware of. There were some that will come and stand in this place that will come like sheep and wolves in sheep's clothing. They come with a false message. They come with a message that will deceive you. Be aware of that, he said. Be aware of those who stand before you to present themselves, not present Christ. But that want to be seen, that want to be their words to be heard. He said, be aware of that. Be aware of all those other things that he spoke about in that 23rd chapter. And as he left the temple that day, he was walking with the disciples, and he stood down outside the temple, and he said, one day, these stones that you see before you now will be destroyed. They will fall. Every one of them will fall in destruction. And he led them further, and he went out to end at the Mount of Olives. And if you've ever had the privilege of going to the Holy Lands, to, to be able to go to the Mount of Olives, it overlooks the city of Jerusalem. And there on the top of that mountain, Jesus stood in a private moment with those 12 that he had called as his disciples. And he was sharing with them in an ultimate moment of joy. And one of the disciples came to him and said, Lord, when will these things come about that you've talked about? When will the temple fall? When will the end of time come? And what signs are we looking for? And Jesus responded and said in that 24th chapter, in verse 24 or so, he says, not even the angels in heaven know when that or I will return. It's not for you to know at this time. Only the Father knows when this time will be. So therefore, he was saying to you and to me and to, to all that would listen to his words, be living a life of expectancy. Be living a life of preparation. Being ready as if every moment possibly could be the moment that Jesus will return. I had a very dear friend by the name of Mark Stone. Mark was a student at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary when a very tragic event took place in his life. He had just moved into his apartment uh, complex there on the campus. The floors were kind of dirty, and, and, and so Mark and his wife decided they would clean the floors. Mark got a, a little rag, and he began to scrub the floors. But he didn't, wasn't aware that they had a hot water heater that had a gas light on it that, that lit the, the water to keep it warm. And he got a little too close to the hot water heater. And that rag had a consum uh, consumable flame that came out and lit the flag in the on the rag on fire. And soon Mark himself was a flaming torch. He ran out of the apartment. He rolled on the ground to try to put the fire out. He thought for a moment, this would be my very last moment that I have here on earth. I soon will die. And he prayed this prayer. He said, Dear Lord, Send me at least one person that I can talk to about you. The very last thing that I say, let it be the words of some, me sharing with someone else the story of Jesus Christ. About that time, a little boy came out of the apartment, walked up to see this man lying on the ground, burning in flames. The fire had been distinguished in a moment, and Mark looked up to the little boy, and he asked him, he said, Son, do you know Jesus? He said, I wanted the last thing that I did is on the, this earth to be the opportunity of me sharing the story of Jesus Christ with someone else. Hopefully, you and I, we don't know when our time on earth will come to an end. We don't know whether to be today, tomorrow, or next week, or maybe many years to come. Therefore, we need to live our life in expectancy living our life being prepared, being ready, as if this day, this moment, could be the day that we meet Christ. And so Jesus, after he had told his disciples they didn't know when he would return, he gave them a challenge and he told some parables in that 25th chapter. He begins first with the parables of the ten virgins. If 
five virgins, he said, came to the wedding feast. They brought their oil lamps filled with oil and ready being prepared. No matter what time the hour came that the bridegroom would come, they would be ready to meet him. Five came with just a short supply of, of oil, and the oil ran out before the bridegroom came, and they were unprepared. They were not ready to meet him. And the Lord was saying, make sure that you are prepared. Make sure you have all the necessary resources to, at your disposal, ready to be used so that you'll be prepared when the time shall come, whenever it might be. He ends that chapter with the story of the sheep and the goats, challenging them to make sure that we're doing everything that we possibly can to, to minister to every people in the name of the Lord. But the parable I want to look at this morning is found in the middle of that chapter. It begins in verse 14. If you would, listen as we read together the Word of God from Matthew, the 14th, 25th chapter, and verse 14. And it says this, Again, I will be like a man going on a journey, when he called his servants and he entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who received the five talent went at once and put the money to work and gifted five more. So also the one with the two talents went and gained two more. But the man who received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. And after a long time, the master of those servants returned and set an account with them. The man who received the five talents, though, brought five others. Master, he said, you've entrusted me with five talents. See, I've gained five more. And the master replied, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two talents also came and said, Master, you've entrusted me with two talents. See, I've gained two more. The master replied, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who received the one talent came and said, Master, I knew that you're a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I went and hid your money and talent in the ground. And see, what I, here is what I belongs to you. The master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. You knew that I harvest where I had not sown and gather where I had not scattered seed. Well, then you should have at least put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For everyone who has much will be given more. And he who has abundance wherever does not have, even then will be taken away from him and thrown that worthless servant outside into darkness where there will be weeping and gashing of teeth. As a small child, I remember oftentimes coming home from school and the very first thing that you would do would change out of your school clothes. You'd put on your play clothes, but before you went out and played, you, you had to do your homework, making sure that everything was ready for the next day. And then if you finished and there was still time, you were allowed to go outside and play. And one of the games I loved to play was hide and seek. Uh, you know how hide-and-seek goes. One person chosen to close their eyes and begin to count. Maybe they count from one to a hundred. And the rest of the people scatter, and they go to try to hide the place to hide so they couldn't be found. And always when the person that was the seeker, he would let it be known, ready or not, here I come. We knew when that person called that out, they would soon become searching and looking for us. But here Jesus told the story, he, no one knows really when will return. He's not calling out and say, ready or not, here I come. He wants us to live a life in readiness and preparation as if this moment could be right now. But he said, I call you and I give to you. In the book of Ephesians, in the third chapter, in verse 8, it says, Jesus called together when he ascended on high. He called all those that were in captive, and to each one of them he gave a gift. You see, the story that Jesus was telling, the master represented him. He was the master. He called together his servants, and that's you and me, the Christian family. He called us together, and he said, I'm entrusting with you. 
some different talents, but according to your ability, I want to give to each of you. To one man he gave five talents, to another he gave two talents, and to another he gave one talent. Historians tell us if you began to study a talent is, is money. And back in those days, it was silver. And silver in that day, the, the, according to the weight that it had, uh, that would make up a talent. In today's value, one talent would be worth $500,000. And so when Jesus called together those people, he said, I'm giving you the talent. He gave to one two and a half million dollars in our modern day money. To another, he gave a million. To another, he gave 500,000. He was entrusting them with a worthy large amount of money. He was entrusting you and me, the church, with all the resources we need to accomplish the mission of the church. Remember the words that he shared when he ascended. All authority is given to me under heaven. I'm sending you out. I'm challenging you, the church, to go out and to make disciples, to baptize them, to teach them, and to share with them the great good news of Jesus Christ. You see, he believed in you and me, the church. He entrusted us with this mission, this mission to go out and to proclaim to every man, woman, and child the good news that Jesus saved. There was a little legend about that when Jesus ascended into heaven. The angels came to him, one of them, and said, Lord, did you make a mistake when you entrusted those people to do the work? Couldn't you have found some other better person to do the work that needs to be done than rather it be man? And Jesus' response was, no, I believe in them. I believe that those who have been called by my name, who have followed me, that I taught and then I challenged and I entrusted them, will be able to accomplish the task. They will receive that what gift has been given to them, and they will be faithful and diligently using that to the glory of God. When you and I have this opportunity to be an ambassador that we're all called to be, talk about it in 2 Corinthians, that we're all called to be the ambassadors of Christ. That, that means you and me as people that sit in the pew have been challenged to proclaim and to share the good news, the good news, what, what Jesus has done for us. I'm a sinner saved by grace. It was not of my works and he's, any of us should boast. For 48 years, I've had the privilege of serving in a church. Every Sunday I stood, as I said, in a sense shaking in fear of maybe saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing that would maybe mislead a person. I prayed to God that that would never happen, that I would be faithful and diligent, do the very best that I possibly could to not be presenting myself, but present Jesus Christ, to present what he had done for me. You see, I had failed him. I had let him down in times like all of us have. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But he loved us enough that he was willing to die for us. And because he died and was buried, he arose and lives again, and he made the promise that one day he will come to take us home. When he ascended into heaven, the angel said, Ye men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven? This same Jesus that leaves us this day will come again. And until that time, we're to work and do our very best for him. Now, Paul says it's not by our works that we're saved, at least any of us should boast. But he also says we're God's workmanship and that we're to do good works for him as best that we can to do for the glory of God. And so Jesus told this story. To those that were living a life of expectancy, living a life of maybe not knowing when he would return, but with the challenge of living as if it could be today, he says to each of us, continue to be faithful and diligent. And that's what two of those people did. They took what had been given to them by God, and they went out immediately and multiplied that good work. The one who had received the five went out and quickly made five other talents. 
The one who received two went out quickly and, and made two others. They were faithful in what had been given to them. They thanked God for the privilege that they had of serving him and using that talent wisely. Not that they would be praised by man, but they would be able to bring back and give glory to God. But one man took what had been given to them, and in fear he took, and the Bible said, he went out and dug a hole in the ground. And he put that talent, that $500,000, in the ground, and he covered it up. He didn't want to misuse it, but he didn't do what he was expected of him. You see, God had entrusted him with his possession, his very best. He said, I believe in you. I'm giving to you so that you might take what has been given to you, that you might use it, that you might work with it, and then you might be able to bring back to me more than what has been given to you. And so, after a while, the master came back from his journey. And the Bible says that each of those servants came and stood before their master in a time of reckoning. The first one came back and said, Master, I want to thank you so much for you giving me all those five talents. And I went out and I worked with them, I multiplied it, and I bring back to you now not just five, but I bring back to you ten. The same with the man who brought out two. Lord, I want to thank you for entrusting me, believing in me, and giving me these two talents. And I went out and worked with it and multiplied it, and I'll bring you back two more. But to the one, he came back and said, Lord, I was afraid of you. I, I went out and I, I didn't believe that I could do anything with this one talent. And so I hid it in the ground so I wouldn't misspend it or I wouldn't lose it or it wouldn't be stolen away. And I bring back to you only what you have given to me. My friend, I'm glad that God has entrusted you and me and all the Christian family. He said, I believe in you enough that I'm giving to you the responsibility of going out and making other disciples, going out and reproducing yourself, going out and showing and telling what Jesus has done for you. The greatest privilege that I've ever been given to me is to be able to stand here and to share of what God has placed upon my heart. I don't stand here saying, look at me, look at what I've done. Or look at me when I was a pastor and what it was accomplished there, the number of baptisms, how the church had grown. I wanted to make sure at as best I possibly can, I was humbly standing as one of God's servants and proclaiming and sharing what he had done for me. He loved me as I was a sinner. He loved me enough that he was willing to die for me and to give me his very best. And he believed in me enough that when he called us by name, and he's called you by name to come and to follow him, to walk with him and to, to serve him and to go out and to share with others the greatest story that's ever been told, the story of Jesus, the story of the one who is perfect in every way, the one who was willing to die for sinners like you and me, the one who arose and conquered the grave. The one who ascended and went and made that journey, but he's not yet come back, but one day will come back by his own promise that he has made, that he will return and the trumpet will sound, and we who have followed him faithfully and obedient will come to meet him in the clouds. But until that time, the church must be at work, doing and accomplishing the mission that God has entrusted us to do. To those that came back with the five talents and the two talents, listen to what Jesus said. He said, you've been faithful in what is given to you. I want you to know that I'm going to reward you with even more work to be done. You see, our work here on earth is never going to be complete. 
You can say, well, I've lived, I've worked hard, I've, I'm an old person now, I can retire, I can sit back and rest on my laurels because I've done my part. That's not what God is saying. God says, until the day I return, I want you to be at work for me. I want you to be sharing that good news, to sharing others and to telling others how I've touched you, how I've changed you, and I've made a difference in your life. The work of us, the servants, will never be complete. He rewarded them by saying, you've been faithful and obedient. I'm going to give you even more to do now. But he also said, because of the work that you've done, because of your faithfulness, I want you to come with the assurance that there's a place with your name on it, a place where you can come and receive all the glory, all my inheritance, a place called heaven where I want you to come and reside with me. My friends, that's what I want to hear. Well done, thou good and faithful servant, not just from man, but I want to be able to hear it from Jesus Christ. And I was faithful and obedient as best that I possibly could as we served him and the opportunities of ministry that he gave to us. I don't want to be like that one person who came and said, Lord, I was afraid. I was afraid that you would seek that which you hadn't even planned to see that, that you would expect the harvest there. Lord, I was afraid that you might think that I, just because I had one talent, I can't do much with that one talent. I don't have the talent to play a musical instrument. I don't have the talent to sing like so many others do. But I'm so glad that the one talent that I do have, and I faithfully used it for God. And I said, God, you've entrusted me. Now I want to be faithful and obedient to you. And I will strive to the day that I die that I will give my very best back to you. In 1978, there was a young skinny boy that lived in Wilmington, North Carolina that had a dream that he would become a star on his high school basketball team. The coach at that time was a man by the name of Leroy Smith. And so this young boy came to that first tryout. He tried his best to impress the coach. But the coach looked at the young boy and he said, Son, you're too skinny. You don't have the talent. You don't have the ability to make the first team in the varsity. I'm not going to allow you to play on the varsity team. If you want to try out, I'll allow you to come and maybe play on the JV team. Maybe you can improve your skills. Maybe you could become a better player. Young boy went home that night. He went to his bedroom. He locked his door. He cried himself to sleep because this is his dream. His dream was to become a star in basketball. The next day, he got up and said, I'm going to prove Leroy Smith wrong. Yeah, I'm going to continue to practice. I'm going to continue to use this talent that I believe I have. And so he practiced day after day. He later made the JV team. Next year, he was able to make the varsity. He laid, a lot of times, he made some mistakes in his team loss. Over 9,000 times, his team on high school, a college, or professional, his team lost. Over 300 times, he missed a shot that he could have made, he said. 26 times, the ball was thrown to him with the last seconds of the clock ticking off, and he had the chance to win the game, and he missed the shot, and his team lost. His name was Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan became one of the greatest stars at the University of North Carolina. He became one of the greatest stars for the Chicago Bulls. He became a legend, but his first coach said, you're too lazy, you're too small, you're too skinny, you don't have the talent. I'm not going to allow you to be on the team. He could have easily given up. He could have easily said, my dream is shattered. But he believed that he had been entrusted with the talent, with the ability. 
And he said, I'm not going to put it to waste. I'm not going to let it go unused. I'm going to use it for the very best of my ability. Now, he might have been doing it for himself, but he still set a challenge to you and I to never, ever give up, even though the world says you're just a one-talent person, even though you might be afraid of what has been given to you that you maybe haven't been given as much as someone else. This young man said, I will use it and I will prove someone wrong. May you and I, the church, prove the world wrong. May we who sometimes say we're just a one-talent person be able to say, I do maybe just have one talent, but I will use it to the very best of my ability to lift up the name of Jesus Christ that I will proclaim his glory and his power and his majesty, and I will let the world know, and I'm proud to be called a follower of his. I'm proud to be called a servant of his. I'm proud that the master has called me to be a follower of his, that he entrusted me with a mission, that he entrusted me with a talent, and he said, go out and use it, because one day I'm coming again, and one day all of us will stand before him and we must reckon with what has been given to us. What did we do with it? Did we use it and multiply it? And did we bring back and say, God, I bring back to you so much more even than what you gave to me. One of the greatest thrills that I had as a pastor was when a young boy came up to me several years after I left the church that I pastored. And he said, Pastor, I want you to know that because you preach the Word of God, that you shared with me the challenge to be somebody special, to use what had been given to me. And I want you to know that your messages brought me closer to Christ. And I want to serve him, and I want to follow him. I want to go into ministry. It wasn't me that did that. It was Christ who gave me the message, just as Paul said. I preach not myself, not what I've learned, not what man has taught me, but I preach what has been revealed to me by the power of God. You and I stand here today on the threshold of knowing that we, the church, can be a great church because we're believers and followers of Jesus Christ. That He's called us by name to come and to follow Him, to walk with Him, to serve Him. And He's given to some of you five talents. He's given to others two talents. To others He's given one talent. But listen, He gave to everyone that He called a gift. Paul reminds us, and as we said in the book of Ephesians, when he ascended into heaven, he called us to come, and to each one he gave a gift. To each of us who call ourselves a Christian, a follower of Christ, he's giving us a gift. How will we use it? How will we use it and stand with him? Helen Steiner Rice wrote a little poem that I keep with my Bible. It's called The Bend of the Road. Sometimes we come to life's crossroads and we view what we think is the end. But God has such a larger vision and he knows it's only a bend. The road will go on and go on and get smoother and often we stop for a rest. The path that leads hidden beyond us is often the path that is best. So rest and relax and grow stronger. Let go and let God show your, share your load and have faith in your brighter tomorrow or you just come to a bend in the road. My friends, we stand on the road of life right now. Many of us look down that road of life and we say, where will it lead us? Where will it take us? There's two roads that verge in the forest. And I, I took the one less traveled by and it made all the difference in the world. God is putting us into crossroads right now. He said, I've called you I've entrusted you. Now what will you do when I've left with you, the church? Will you use it wisely? Will you use it 
not for your glory, but for the glory of the Father. Will you walk down the road of life that leads us to that road that where we hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You will faithful here on earth with what I was given to you. I invite you now to come and to share all the glories and all the rewards of what has been prepared for you. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Hopefully none of us will hear the words, you lazy, slothful servant. I gave to you, and you hid it in the ground. You put it and never used it. You never did anything with that talent that I entrusted you with. I believed in you. I believed that you could use that talent, and your dream and hopes would be fulfilled. Never, ever give up. That's what Michael Jordan did, and you saw what he was able to do. What will you and I be able to do for the one that we call Master, and we who are servants have been called by him? What will we do with what has been trusted to us? Will we take it? Will we go and say, Lord, I'm so thankful that you believed in me. I'm so thankful that you trusted me with the provisions that I needed to accomplish the work that you've called us to do as a church. Thank you, Father, for what you have led us to do. Thank you, Father, for believing in us. He believes in each one of us in this room today. He believed in us that he gave us some type of talent, maybe a five talent, maybe a two talent, but he gave to every one of us a talent. Now what will we do with it? How will we use it? Will we use it for our glory so that we can be seen of man, so that we can be patted on the back and say, you've done a good job? Or do we do it so that we could hide behind the cross of Jesus and not man look at us, but because of what we've said and what we've done, they're able to see Jesus living in us. That's what I hope that every one of us do this morning. And we want to say, Lord, it is not about me. It is all about you. And I want the world to be able to see and to hear the story of Jesus and what he's done for me. Whatever talents I have, whether they be five, two, or one, I use it to glorify you and to lift you on high, to praise your name and give you all the glory that you richly deserve. Church, we have been gifted and entrusted by God to go out and to make disciples, to go out and to teach his word, to go out and to baptize. And to the day he returns, the marching orders are ours. They've never been rescinded. We, the church, must march on and give all the glory to the risen Savior. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for what you have done for each of us. That you loved us enough that you gave your all. Lord, you loved us enough that you were willing to lay down your life on Calvary's tree. We didn't deserve it. We haven't earned it. But Lord, we use the talent to the very best of our abilities that the world might be able to see in each of us the living Christ the master, the creator, the owner of all things. Lord, we're just your stewards. We are your servants. And we have been called and entrusted with the mission that you left for us to do. May we be faithful and obedient day by day so that you might be glorified. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. As the praise team comes back and as we come to singing our hymn of invitation. May we look and say that we want to be that Michael Jordan of a sort. We want to believe in what has been given to us. Enough that we will never ever give up. We won't ever quit. But that we will use every day the talent that has been given to us. That has been trusted to us by Jesus Christ. That we will use it not for us not for the one sitting beside us, but we're to use it for the glory of Jesus Christ, that we would do it so that others might see him living in us.
as we stand and sing this morning, by His amazing grace, He set us free. He's given us the opportunity, the challenge, to make a difference in the world. May we be willing to stand for Him and proclaim the greatest story that's ever been told, the story of Jesus and His love for you and me. May we stand and sing. May we respond as God might lead us. and allowing others to see him living in us day by day. May we go in his grace, may we go in his strength, and may we share his love day by day with all that we meet. Father, as we leave this place...